Welcome to CounterPoint. I'm Tanya Granick allen You'd have to be living under a rock to know that Canadian health care is in a crisis in many provinces. Many of us have seen or perhaps even experienced long waits for MRIs, MCTs, or even a lengthy delay to see a specialist. Perhaps most jarring is the long emergency room wait time, if the emergency room is even open that day. It isn't unusual, after all, to see an ER closed be it in the rural counties or even in a large metropolis like Toronto, for example, and usually due to staffing shortages. And look, we understand. COVID ran roughshod over the entire system. Staff is exhausted. But as we exit COVID and try to put all of that behind us, is the system moving forward with us? And is the vaccine mandate for healthcare workers only exacerbating an already tenuous situation? Are more Canadians dying on wait lists than before? So what does healthcare look like in Canada? There is so much to discuss around this topic, and joining me now to add his perspective is Colin Craig, president of secondstreet.org, a public policy think tank, and Dr. Sean Watley, a Macdonald Laurier Institute Monk Fellow, author and past president of the Ontario Medical Association. Thank you, gentlemen, both for joining me. Again, very uh, important issue, one that we have to unpack for our viewers because, you know, we want good health care when that time, hopefully not soon, when that time comes. We want to be able to rely on what was previously known as a very good, robust health care system. So we'll start with you, Dr. Sean Watley. You're a doctor, a medical doctor. Give me the lay of the land. Uh, what does the Canadian health care experience look like these days? Well, for far too many people, especially our most vulnerable patients, when they get to the point where they need some care, they end up waiting in a packed out waiting room, crowded people, you know, vomiting or with fevers. And, and, and then when they actually need to get admitted into a hospital, they'll spend over 30 hours at the 90th percentile, which is a fancy way of saying the longest waits to get a bed up inside the hospital for our sickest people. They're lying in stretchers in hallways for over a day and a half. And it's just really unconscionable. So there's two kinds of Medicare. There's the Medicare that we have in our dreams that will be there when we're sick enough to need it. And then the Medicare of reality that far too many of our most vulnerable patients are experiencing. But hallway health care, to use an expression, or, or you know, seeing patients in stretchers and stretchers emerge, I, I recall this being an issue, you know, at least a decade ago. Uh, it's not a new phenomenon, but closing of ERs seem to be a new phenomenon. What's going on there? Well, we had closing of ERs in the late 1990s as well, and it's unusual to see it again coming back uh, today. But I'll, I'll, I'll throw a few statistics at you just to give yeah, the audience a bit of a sense. So in 1990, and, and I apologize for using Ontario data, but we had 33,400 beds in 1990, or 3.2 per 1,000 population, and we spent about 8 percent of our GDP. So 33,000 beds, 1990. In 2017, our population had grown by 36%, but our number of hospital beds had dropped to 18,577, or only 1.3 per thousand. And yet we were spending 11.3% of our GDP. So in healthcare, we've tried to use this more with less approach. How far can we stretch the money to care for as many people as possible? And actually what we've done is we've provided less care for more money. It's eating up more of our GDP. So that's the background story. People working really, really hard, you know, doing the best they can, but we're just trying to do more with less and we're actually doing less care for more money. Okay. So those stats you shared with me are are shocking, which you shared with us all. So if I understand it, we have almost half as many beds as we have 30 years ago in Ontario. Correct. Now, in fairness, in fairness, people will jump out and say, well, listen, we're doing some outpatient procedures and we're doing some day surgery and not as many people need beds. So you have to you have to balance it a wee bit. But when you look at the number of beds we have compared to the rest of the world, we're down at around the rate of Mexico or some other um, um, countries that maybe we think we're doing better than, at least from a financial perspective. So uh, I think we've cut and cut and cut. And finally, even before the pandemic, the public was coming to realize that maybe those cuts have gone so far that our dream of Medicare when we actually need it has not is not going to be a reality when we actually get to the emergency department. And I know during COVID, obviously, it highlighted a lot of concerns with one uh, component of healthcare, which is the long-term care, uh, when those uh, either in a palliative condition or, or just need long-term care and are in a facility, some of the 
uh, holes or weaknesses within that system. And we, we will never forget those images of the army going into Quebec and Ontario trying to straighten things out. We're going to continue this discussion, this very important one, when we return in just a few moments. Welcome back to Counterpoint. I'm Tanya Granick Allen. We're discussing Canadian healthcare and perhaps its shortcomings. What's going on in the system? We have Dr. Sean Watley, a past president of the Ontario Medical Association and senior monk fellow here with us today, and Colin Craig, president of secondstreet.org. Before we crunch some of the numbers in terms of wait times, Colin, Dr. Watley, what other provinces or, or which provinces or territories are, seem to be most affected or uh, are really struggling with the delivery of healthcare these days? Oh, that's a great question to say, which is the worst of the worst? I, I, tried, <laughs> to, all I tried to put it a politically correct spin on it or try to <laughs> soften the blow. <laughs> Well, I mean, if you look at, at uh, PEI, they just got hit by a hurricane. So I, I, I think they would be struggling a great deal there. I was on a, another uh, radio call in pro program and, and people were calling in and saying, you know, I, I can't, it's not just about my weight to see the GP. I can't even get a GP. And so now I'm getting primary care through the emergency department. Now that's also the case in Northern Ontario, but it seems like the Maritimes have been really hit for hard from a human resources uh, point of view, but all provinces are really struggling. They're struggling. We, we've given the provinces the job of running a provincial um, health maintenance organization, and it doesn't work well. And we've known that for years, and yet we're so resistant to try something new. Okay, gotcha. Well, well, we'll unpack some of the what we can do better in just a few moments. Colin, I want to bring you into this discussion. Again, it's important to look at the very the facts, the black and white numbers, because they definitely tell a story. What are you seeing through some of your research in terms of wait times, uh, you know, in Canada, specifically Ontario? Well, big picture in this country, we've seen uh, spending explode. It's increased well above the rate of inflation. If people check out the Canadian Institute for Health Information's data, they can see that for themselves. So when you adjust for inflation and per person spending, it's up substantially. And as Dr. Watley suggested, we're just not seeing the results. Uh, he's right, absolutely right. We, we trail when it comes to beds per capita, doctors per capita, all those important metrics. And, uh, you know, the data that we've uncovered from Ontario looking at uh, patients dying on waiting lists before they even get the procedures and surgeries they need, uh, the number of patients that were dying before receiving CT scans, uh, it uh, doubled over the past five years. Same thing roughly for uh, MRIs. We've seen an increase in the number of patients dying uh, before they receive surgery. And unfortunately, the Ontario government doesn't really provide a lot of data behind those numbers to say, well, here's what's happening. Here's how many of those cases were cataracts and, uh, you know, knee operations, heart surgery, those types of things. But uh, it certainly is troubling when you have people uh, seeing a deterioration of their quality of life in their final years. So could you give us some of those uh, raw numbers? Uh, for example, how many, I, I, one area that I know uh, is, is very stressed right now is there are exceedingly long MRI wait times in Ontario. In fact, for a family member, I just put a call in the other day and I was told it would be like six to eight months uh, and maybe go elsewhere. And I know a lot of Canadians are now going over the border or trying to seek some private options, but what are you seeing here? Well, that's, <laughs> you've hit the nail on the head. A lot of Canadians uh, will leave the country and they'll go abroad for healthcare. Then the weird thing is, is that quite often you could go to another province and pay for healthcare, but you can't pay for healthcare in your own province. So you'll see uh, you know, someone from Vancouver will fly to Calgary. They can pay for surgery there, but a Calgarian can't pay in Calgary for surgery. So then the Calgarian has to fly to Vancouver. Okay, explain so, that to our audience because that might have, uh, the, explain and unpack that. So if I am a resident of British Columbia, yes. I don't have healthcare, I do or I don't have healthcare coverage in other provinces. Well, you would if it was an emergency situation, but let's say you're a, so you're living in Vancouver and the government tells you it's going to be a year before they can get your hip operation. You can go to another province and pay for your hip operation at a private clinic, but you can't pay at a private clinic in British Columbia. So it doesn't make sense Got for it. the environment to force people to have to travel so far to, to pay for surgery. It doesn't make sense for the healthcare system either. Uh, when you have both options available for patients, a public system that they can use or a private one where they pay out of pocket, that's a good thing because it takes pressure off of the public system every time someone does decide 
to pay out of pocket. So that's that's fundamentally one of the problems with our system in Canada is that we, the government enforces essentially a monopoly, forces everyone into one waiting list. And well, you know, I often think of it as being like in a grocery store. You're waiting in a long line at a grocery store on a Saturday or of whatever day, time of the week, and you wonder, well, why don't they open up another line? That's right. essentially what our healthcare system does. We, we quite often don't allow a second line for someone to go for a, uh, a private procedure or to receive a, a diagnostic scan privately or, or et cetera. We're going to continue this discussion in just a few moments. Welcome back. We're talking about the state of Canadian health care. Perhaps you live in a province and you've gone to your emergency room and perhaps it's been closed. Perhaps you needed an MRI or a CT and just to be told that it is a several month delay, perhaps even up to a year. But we're going to talk about that a little bit more with Colin Craig and Dr. Sean Watley. Dr. Watley, you know, we, we chatted about some of the things that we're seeing, and one of them that I've that I've highlighted, and you've mentioned out east definitely is a concern in the eastern provinces, is staffing shortages. And again, I you know, maybe this happened in the 90s. I was just a little girl then. I don't recall there being staffing shortages and we had to shut down the ER, but apparently this happened in 1990. Why why is this happening? Why why doesn't the government just hire more people? Are there enough people? Is this about uh staff that who got vaccine mandated out of a job should they just not all be hired back would that help yeah so just to just to clarify i said late 1990s early 2000s so the bear stoddard report in 1992 said we need to cut medical school enrollment and then by the end of the 1990s we had well over 1.7 million people without a family doc just in ontario and now we have over 5 million people without a family doc uh, in canada the last figures i saw so the question about staffing is a tricky one absolutely firing people laying them off because they wouldn't get a vaccine that's going to have an impact even even 100 people will it'll have an impact. But the fascinating thing, and, and we have to be careful that we're not kicking hospitals when they're down. Some hospitals don't close and they never close. Other hospitals are on the verge of closure all the time. And so you're really getting down to the level of management. So certain ICUs are managed well and everybody wants to work there. Certain emergency departments, everybody wants to work there. So you're going beyond simply an HR capacity problem and we're digging down into the nitty gritty of management. So I better stop there before I insult some of my colleagues in hospitals, but you're asking a question that actually goes beyond capacity to the management of the capacity we currently have. Well, when I, when I go into a hospital and I, you know, I have many children and family members, so I tend to go in occasionally, you know, I always, I always feel very badly for the frontline staff, for the doctors and the nurses. And I know that it's an overwhelming task they have to deliver such a large health care on such a, a small, well, what I thought of was a small budget, apparently not so small after all. But they always seem so stretched. And I always wished, you know, and I have friends who are nurses and doctors, and I always say, well, can they just not hire another nurse to... to to ease the burden? Can something be done? And it seems to be this perennial discussion of how do we solve, how do we lighten the load for these healthcare workers who are simply burnt out? Yeah, so I, I, the way I frame this, actually, you know, some people say, well, we'll just give them an extra thousand bucks, right? I think they did that in Ontario just recently. We'll give them an extra bonus just to, in acknowledgement of all the hard work you did through COVID. Well, knowledge workers actually aren't motivated by rewards as much as they are by the opportunity to be creative, to use their skills, to advance their skill set, to do meaningful work. And so those are intrinsic motivators. And right now, the way the system is structured, we are just crushing intrinsic motivators. We're telling knowledge workers that you just need to follow these rules, play within these guidelines, don't use your creativity, don't expand your skills, don't further your career, and don't. And we're not going to give you the resources that you need to provide the care that you know patients need. So we're crushing the intrinsic motivators and then saying, where's all our staff? So it sounds like there's a systemic issue, that the system is almost set up to produce this negative result, and I'm not suggesting that was contrived in that regard, but that's actually what's happening. Is, is that correct? I think that's a that's a good way of saying it. Um, we we try to control 
centrally what's happening at the bad side. And then when bad things happen, because we're because we're not giving enough resources, we try to increase the amount of control we have centrally with more guidelines, more regulations, more uh, procedural checklists and and staff can't they don't like it that's not why they went into care they health care they went into health care to actually care for patients and not be not to be told by someone else how they're supposed to care for patients so knowing that this obstacle exists if i can use that phrase then how does one remove that obstacle how do we cut out all that middle management the bureaucracy if you will of delivering health care So you're asking a question that dates back to the 1940s, right? Managerialism. How do we solve managerialism in Western society? And I don't think I can answer that in a short short way. What I do think we can try to do, at least when it comes to healthcare, and I'm writing another book about this actually, is we have to start asking the big questions again. Too often we jump to the policy issues. Oh, we'll just hire more nurses. We'll just open more beds. We'll just build more hospitals. So those are the policy solutions, polyclinics, whatever it is, public-private partnerships, that sort of thing. I think we need to take a step back and ask, what are we trying to achieve? So some people, most Canadians, I think, believe we have health care so that we can get, quote unquote, free care, or at least we'll get care when we need it. Other people, so for example, Roy Romano, he's been very public in this. He refers to Medicare as our great redistributive program. So okay, I'm going to pause you there, Dr. Watley. We're wrapping up our discussion on the state of Canadian healthcare and how that affects you and maybe what can be done to better it. And join me again is Colin Craig and Dr. Sean Watley. Before the break, Dr. Watley, we were having a very good discussion about uh, not just the state of Canadian healthcare, but how, how things are managed, if you will. Please continue where you were left off. Yeah, so I think to to fix what we have, we have to start back at the beginning and ask, why do we have Medicare? What do what do the citizens of Canada actually want? I think most people want care when they need it. That's what they look at Medicare as offering. However, however, other elites in society, and I mentioned Roy Robineau, he's been very public on this. He refers to Medicare as our great redistributive program, and so it's a it's a way to transfer money from the from the wealthy and the healthy to the sick and the poor. And so, if that is our objective we're trying to achieve, that will deliver very different performance. And so we need to have these fundamental debates and actually bring Canadians into the debate. Furthermore, Canada is different. Canada in 1960 is very different than Canada today. We're older, we're much more diverse. So we need to start from first principles. What are we trying to achieve? Who are we trying to help? And what are the constitutional constraints within which we're trying to help them? So I would suggest that's where we need to start. And then we can talk about policy options. Now, Colin, uh, you know, again, your organization is very good at highlighting the numbers, which I appreciate, and it leads the reader to say, well, where do we go from here? How do we fix it? You know, is private health care, what does even private health care look like? Is that as an option? Uh, would that solve things, in your opinion? Yes, and I think, I think we have to be very careful when we talk about private health care, because what most people who talk about reform are meaning is that we keep the public health care system. So just as people can go to their, their doctor right now or get their hip done or whatever, and they don't receive a huge bill directly for it, uh, that would continue. But you would allow patients the choice that if you didn't want to wait a year to get your hip done, you could go to a private clinic in Canada in your own city and pay for it and get that done. That would actually help. It would help increase the number of people working in the system. You'd have more competition. It could lead to innovation. There's all kinds of benefits. Most importantly, countries that outperform Canada, they give patients that choice. Those universal healthcare systems that do better in countries like Sweden and Australia and New Zealand, uh, they give patients that choice between the public and private options. Because so that's definitely part of it. Let's face it, Colin, pa- patients still do have the choice. They go to America, they go to Mexico, or they'll go to India. They'll, they'll pursue what they want to pursue if they need something done. It's just that money's not staying in Canada. It's going to a private clinic in the U.S. So would it not just make sense to just have that option locally so people didn't have to travel so much? And I mean, again, I'm not, I don't like to view healthcare as a business, but at the end of the day, there's a need or there's a demand. Let's, let's fill it. Yeah, exactly. You know, I talked to a patient recently. He was in Edmonton and he needed back surgery. It was going to take a long time in Alberta to get this, the surgery done in the public system. And he looked across Canada because there are some private clinics. There's one in Calgary, but he couldn't go there because he's an Alberta resident. So he even considered 
moving to British Columbia so that he could then come back to his home province to go to Calgary to do it. In the end, that didn't work. And what he ended up doing was going to Atlanta. So it makes no sense from an environmental perspective to make patients have to increase their carbon footprint just to get health care. It doesn't make sense for patients to force them to wait in pain for so long and give them no options. It doesn't make sense for the economy uh, when that happens because patients end up taking thousands of dollars out of our economy and spending it somewhere else, supporting organizations that hire and employ people in other countries. So it doesn't make sense on many different fronts. Now, we only have a minute before left of the show, and, and maybe Dr. Watley or Colin, I don't know who wants to take this, but Quebec has an interesting model. Is it unique? Because, uh, you know, I have been informed that they have some kind of two-tier system. Is that correct, Dr. Watley? Yeah, so they're slowly offering more and more procedures within a non-government system. And to build on that, people get scared, oh, you're going to steal doctors and nurses. Well, actually, in Ontario, for example, we have IVF procedures available privately. If we only offered them publicly, we could only afford to have about five or six clinics in, in Ontario. We actually have close to 13 clinics, somewhere between 12 and 13 clinics spread across the north, the southwest, all over the place, because we offer a blended pro approach. So care closer to home, more people being hired, a greater a building of the industry because we offer that blend. And I think that's what Colin's calling for. Okay, well, this has been a very good discussion. And I know we're going to have to touch upon it in the near future again. But thank you both for joining me. Thanks a lot. Well, we've highlighted a lot of concern here within the Canadian healthcare system. And of course, the point of bringing you these facts and figures and, and the accounts, firsthand accounts, is to tell you that there's a concern here and we need to make it better. And hopefully some of these discussion points will in fact trickle down and make the system better. For CounterPoint, I'm Tanya Granik-Allen.